heart can drive away all sorrow. I know a name that is sweeter than them all. I know a name from which comfort I may borrow. When others fail and when tears of anguish fall, I know a name, a wonderful name, that wonderful name above all others. Oh, sacred name by angelic host adorned, I know a name that is altogether lovely. Oh, precious name of my living Christ, And the Lord, I know a name, a wonderful name, that wonderful name is Jesus. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Father, we are grateful to Thee for Thy faithfulness. Thou dost take the little that we have, and as the blows and fishes of old, You multiply it and bless it. And we pray that it might be true again tonight. We know there are needy hearts before us tonight. We have no desire to impress anybody with anything except their need of Christ. And we have no desire for anybody to be seen here tonight except Christ. And whatever happens, we want it to be to thy glory. We don't want any man to get any credit for anything that takes place. So take control of this service at this point. And wilt thou apply thy word as thou alone canst do it, and then woo and draw people to thy Son, for Jesus' sake. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke, the 8th chapter, I'm going to read starting with the 26th verse. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth the land, they met him out of the city a certain man which had demons long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. And he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion because many demons are entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the demons out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled, and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the demons were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the demons was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarenes round about besought him to depart from them. For they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. Now the man out of whom the demons were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things 
God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. When you read this story, you naturally feel sorry for the demon-possessed man. But you don't need to waste any sympathy on this man. Because when the story ends, he's clothed in his right mind and everything's fine as far as he's concerned. But the people you need to feel sorry for in this story are the well-dressed, intelligent people of the city. Who, when they saw that the presence of Jesus Christ was bad for their illicit business, had to make a decision between their business and Jesus Christ. And many people in the world today are having to decide between their interests and Jesus Christ. And in this case, they decided they'd rather have their business than the Savior. And so they said, you'd be bad for business around here. We'd appreciate it if you'd just leave. And he accommodated. He got in the ship. And he left. Jesus will always do what you want him to do. He's a gentleman. He'll come and knock at your heart, but he won't knock the door down. He'll ask you to let him in, but he has to be invited before he comes. And the saddest day for that group of people was when Jesus Christ took them at their word and went away from them and left them in their night of sin at their own command. He went away from them. The Lord Jesus will perhaps speak to somebody in this service tonight. He'll do whatever you ask him to do. Be careful what you say to him. If you want him in, he'll come. If you don't want him, he won't force his way upon you. So be careful tonight what you say to Jesus Christ. I want us to study the man who was demon possessed. I want us to see, first of all, what the devil did to this man. The devil did to him the same thing he does to anybody who turns himself over into the hands of Satan. The devil doesn't have but one program, and that's a program of destruction. His pathway leads down, never up. He can always take away, but he can't give. Satan cannot do anything except destroy and make destitute. And we see a picture of what a man comes to when he turns himself completely into the hands of Satan. And when you refuse Christ, you automatically turn yourself into the hands of Satan. And in this 27th verse, we read the story. And he went forth to land, and they met him out of the city, a certain man which had demons long time. This man was an old time sinner. Maybe one time he was a fine young man, like somebody in this audience tonight, with great ambition clean-limbed and strong and determined. But somewhere in his life he said no to Jesus Christ and decided to allow the devil to control his life and the control of Satan over this man's life through the years. Brought him to this pitiable state, just like it will any person who decides to let Satan control his life. And so he had been a house of demons. So under the control of the devil that the devil was actually using his body to house demons. And so he was an old time sinner. Anybody, if the devil could do anything for anybody, he certainly could do it in that length of time. But if you'll notice, the longer a person serves the devil, the lower down he gets. If he had any program except a program of destruction, he'd lead you upward instead of downward. And it looks like any sinner would look at what Satan does to other people and learn his lesson and automatically turn to Christ. But people don't do that. They watch sin cut down one generation and then they follow blindly into the steps of the generation that went before. And fall into the same traps and lead the devil's same lives. And have their lives wrecked just like folks who went before. And then we notice... What the devil did to him. And wear no clothes. He had robbed him even of the material things with which God loves to bless us. You know, if you have anything material, it came from God. It didn't come from the devil. Sinner or Christian. 
If you have a house, God gave you your house. If you have a car, God gave you your car. If you have a job, God gave you your job. He puts the food on your table. He puts the clothes on your back. He causes your heart to beat. He makes the blood to course through your veins. If God took his finger from your heart, you'd be dead in a second. God does everything good for anybody who has anything good. All of it came from God. None of it from Satan. The Bible says every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there's no bareness, neither shadow of turn. But all Satan can do is what he did to this man, is to rob you even of the material things with which God blesses you. And here this man, after serving Satan all these years, we find him completely destitute and even without clothes. Back during the Depression years, I preached in the largest rescue missions in this nation. I preached to men tramping back and forth over this nation. Whole army of them. I preached to as high as a thousand of them in a single service. I did, preached to them with the thousands. I dealt with them personally with the scores and I led great numbers of them to Jesus Christ. I've seen them coming off the streets in every conceivable shape. I've seen them on zero nights coming off the streets with their feet wrapped with rags begging for a pair of shoes. I've seen them with little seersucker suits pinned up with a safety pin begging for an overcoat. And when they opened the pin and opened their coat, they wouldn't even have a shirt under their seersucker coat. Always begging for rolls, begging for coffee, a place to sleep, tramping, begging back and forth across this nation, destitute men in arms. And after having preached to those men and dealt with those men, I had the first one up. The very first one up to tell me he was in the condition he was in for any other reason than sin. Every one of them would admit that it was sin and Satan in control of their lives that led them to destitution and sent them out in that sort of a shape. Mel Trotter said, I've been a mission man for 40 years. He said, I've seen thousands of religious tramps. But he said, never once in my life have I ever met a Christian bum. David said, I've been old. I've been young and now I'm old. And I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. The devil is the one who makes people destitute. But worst of all, the absence of clothes indicates a man's Guilt before God. When Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they recognized was that they were naked. And turning yourself into the hands of Satan deprives you of anything with which you can appear accepted before God. It strips you naked and makes you ashamed and guilty before God. And this man's nakedness is a type of the condition of a poor lost soul with nothing with which he can stand approved before God. And then the next thing we see the devil did for him. Neither abode in any house. He broke up his home. I think the devil would rather break up a home than any other single act that he can commit. And he's having a field day in America because about 40 some odd percent of all the homes in this nation at the present time are being broken. Whenever a nation comes to the place that it ignores God's law concerning marriage and the sanctity of the home, it's flirting with disaster and it's flirting with judgment. And this strong pillar of the home has just about been snatched from beneath the foundation of our supposedly Christian civilization. And the attitude that people are taking and with the devil in the heart of one or both Couples in a home ripping and tearing apart homes in this nation has us tottering on the very brink of God's judgment tonight. And if the devil can break a home, he can leave marks and scars on children that they'll never get over, and he can make it so children who are raised in homes that are broken over their heads are almost impossible for them to ever establish a home that'll stay together. And if you allow Satan in your home, if you allow him in either of your hearts as parents, if you give him an inroad, the first thing he'll try to do and the thing he will possibly do, and he's so successful at it, is to rip your home apart and send you out with even, without even a roof over your head. That's what he had done to this man. The devil can't keep a home together, but he can sure tear them up. I preached in this state many years ago. In one of your largest cities, 
preached for seven weeks. And we had a revival out over the air. I was preaching every morning for 30 minutes and people got saved, listening to the radio, would call in and say, I accepted Christ. They'd come to the meeting and stand up and say, I trusted the Savior. They'd call in and say, how do you get saved? I heard your message. And we were having a, a revival over the air. And one morning I'd preached. I was in the office answering some mail and I heard a man outside asking for me. And I heard the lady uh, say, he's in the inner office there. He'd be glad to talk to you. And the man walked to the door and stood leaning up against the door jam looking at me. And I thought, well, he wants to talk to me. I'll let him speak first. But he stood there for quite a little bit before he said a word, just looking at him. And I was looking at him, sizing him up while he was sizing me up. And I came to some conclusions about him before he ever opened his mouth. I knew, I knew he was intelligent. I knew he had on a good suit of clothes. I knew he'd slept in his suit and I knew he'd been drunk. I knew all that before he ever said a word. And finally, he said, you the fellow preaches over the radio? I said, yes. He said, I hear you every morning. Or my wife hears you every morning. He says, I, I heard you while she was listening to you. He said, I want to talk to you. And I said, uh, come in and sit down. He sat down across the desk from me. And I said, what can I do for you? He said, well, sir. He said, I got trouble. I said, what kind of trouble? He said, the worst kind. He said, you never saw a fellow with bigger trouble than mine. He said, the devil has taken me all the way to the bottom. He said, preach, I've reached rock bottom. I said, well, tell me about it. He said, well, I have a wife, wonderful Christian wife, and two fine little children. He said, I'm a carpenter, first class. He said, I make a big salary. I draw my paycheck. The first thing I do is to go to the bar and get drunk, and then I gamble away what I have left. And then early Sunday morning or late Saturday night, I go home and start a row with my family and abuse my wife and children. And said, my wife's been telling me she wouldn't put up with it, and I didn't believe her. And so I went home drunk Saturday night and started a row, and she put me out of the house. And he said, Preacher, I've slept in my automobile for two nights. I don't even have a roof over my head. He said, I've destroyed my home. He said, I'm as low as you can go. And he said, I heard you on the radio, and I wondered if you could help me. I said, no, I can't. He said, you can't. I said, no, I can't help. I said, I'm just as sorry as I can be, mister. But I said, there isn't one thing, not one thing on the face of the earth I can do for you. When he said that, he put his head down on the desk and started to sob. And he sobbed and sobbed. And after a while, he looked up through his tears and he said, Preacher, isn't there anybody? Isn't there anybody that can help a poor old sinner like me? Isn't there anybody? I said, yeah, I know somebody that can help you. He said, you do? I said, yes. He said, who is it? I said, his name's Jesus. And when I said Jesus, he fell out of that chair like he'd shot him with 30 off six. And I got down by his side and led him to Christ. We got up off our knees, and I was taking him through some verses of assurance, and I thought I'd before he did, because I'd dealt with so many of them, I knew how his mind would work. And I was just waiting for him to think of it, and after a while I lost his attention. I said, uh uh-huh, he's thinking of it. He looked off in the distance a little bit, and then he turned to me and said, Do you suppose my wife knew I'd gotten saved she'd take me back? I said, I'm afraid she would. <laughs> I said, I know him pretty well. She shouldn't, but I'm afraid she would. He said, Would you go with me to see? I said, Nothing would please me any more than that. And he almost jerked my arm out of the socket. He said, Come on, my car's right out here in front. He dragged me out in his car, and we tore out across town. And he came to us. I said, That's my house. I said, You park around the corner and stay out of sight. If she sees you, she'll go out the back door, and we won't catch her in a week. And I said, You stay out of sight till I need you. <laughs> anything you say, preacher, anything you say. So I went up and knocked on the door, and the door was cracked about two inches, and the anxious little face peered out through that crack. And I said, My name's Fred Brown. She threw the door open and said, I hear you every morning, preacher. Come in. There are the two little kitties on the floor. I talked to her for about five minutes, and she gave me a marvelous testimony. I didn't mention her husband. She didn't either. She had a stiff upper lip. Finally, I said, the reason I came to see you is that I have somebody outside who wants to talk to you. When I said that, she drew back as if I'd slapped her in the face. She said, my husband. I said, not exactly. She said, what do you mean? <laughs> not exactly. I said, I brought you another husband. You brought me a what? She was up there here in husband. She didn't want anything to do with another husband. 
I said, your old husband got saved a while ago. You could have seen the look on that face. Preacher, do you suppose my husband really, do you suppose he really got saved? I said, I'm pretty sure. I said, I was kneeling right by him, and I said, it's a hard, a very hard for a fellow to get saved that close to me without a little, I was slopping over on him. <laughs> she said, then I'll take him back. I said, that's what I thought. And I went to the door, and that fellow had his head sticking out of that car. He had his neck stretched. It looked like a turkey gobbler. You never saw about it. <laughs> I gave him the signal, and he almost took the door off that car coming out of there. And I stood there in that home and watched Jesus Christ put back together what the devil had torn us from. As long as you're without Jesus Christ, you're asking for it. And the only direction that Satan and sin can take you is down. A program of destruction is all the program the devil has for you. And then he did one other thing for this man. He robbed him of his self-respect. Naked. Running around amongst the tombs. Did you ever see a time in the world when so many folks wanted to get naked? I want to tell you when folks get to the place they want to pull their clothes off in public. That's just about as low as you can get. And when people lose every vestige of self-respect and when sin can so debase them until they have not one moral principle left or not a precept that you can appeal to, the devil has taken them past the last station on the road to hell. And when I see how people fall lower than the animals in the barnyard in the mor- morals and in their concept of anything that's decent and respectable, I realize how the devil is so debased people that they're lower than the animals of the field. And after he had ruined this man completely, took, had taken him down the road to destruction until it was completely debased, we see the finished work of sin. And the only thing the devil can do for you if you allow yourself to be controlled by him. But then somebody else comes into the picture. After the devil ruins this man, society steps in and tries to help him. Somebody got him to join something. Perhaps got him to join the AAs. Or the AAAs or something. There are all kinds of things you can join. Heard about a fellow who joined the AAs and the AAAs the same day so he could drive himself to drink. Somebody gave him a towel and a bar of soap. Somebody gave him a suit that her husband had gotten too big for. And somebody wrote it up in the do good report. And society pitched in and tried to rehabilitate this dropout. And uh, all of them had did their best, but when they'd done all they could, and he got so rambunctious they couldn't control him, and their chains wouldn't hold him, then they ran him out of town. The more I see of society, the less I think of it. They used to be on the police force in the city of New York was a captain. Conrad Jensen told me in Scroon Lake, New York, he said, Fred... I'm on 100th Street in Harlem. He said, that's the roughest street in New York. He said, the only way that we're allowed to turn off a fire hydrant in 100th Street, Harlem, is for two of us to back up to it with drone automatics while the third one turns it off. He said, if we try to turn it off any other way, he said, we get our heads knocked off. And he said, if we try to do it any other way, we are fired from the force. But he said, you know, I've been in 100th Street, Harlem. I've been in the Brownstone area, and I've been in the penthouse regions of New York. And he said, Fred, I want to tell you that what goes on in the penthouses in New York City makes what goes on in 100th Street, Harlem look like peanuts. He said, the dirtiest, rottenest segment of society in this United States is the high society of this nation. And that's where the folks who sit down their little, uh, sit up in their little ivory towers and, and put temptations before people. And then when they fall into the trap, then they have a way of getting them out of sight. And society is the one that puts the temptation in the path. And then when their members who are weak fall and they can't help themselves, then the rest of them tries to get them out of sight. 
They don't have the solution. Trying to help their fallen members is like the blind leading the blind and they both wind up falling in the ditch. Back during the war years, Second World War, when this juvenile delinquent thing first got started, I was preaching as I have been for 38 years all over this nation, and I was in nine cities in a row where the ministerial association of the city and the city fathers got together and tried to have something that would be beneficial to their young people and to try to keep them from becoming delinquents. Nine cities in a row. And you know what they did in every city? In every single city, without one exception, they did the same thing, without exception. They threw a big citywide dance on Saturday night for the young people to try to keep them out of trouble. If they'd mapped out their strategy in hell, they couldn't have come up with a cleverer way to destroy the morals of young people than that. And the one thing that has enticed more to sin and caused more characters to be ruined than any other thing that American people practice is the first thing the society thought of to try to preserve young people. But oh, they were way ahead of the game because if some little innocent girl gets caught, they have a Florence Crittendom home in a distant city they've already prepared and they can slip her out of town at night and she can have her baby and come back home and nobody knows the difference. Society comes along and puts liquor under everybody's nose. It's got to have. And then when some member of society can't contain himself and becomes a blithering alcoholic, and starts embarrassing his host by messing up the oriental rug and becomes a nuisance and can't control himself. They have a nice keely cure off in some distant city. They can ship him out and try to dry him out. They don't have the answer. And this clumsy world and its clumsy effort to try to undo what it does by placing temptation in people's path. And when the devil has ruined a man, there's not one thing that society around him can do to elevate him. And they don't have the answer. They don't have the solution. And all the efforts wind up in the same way, a dead-end street with nothing done for the person and his condition worse than when they took hold of it. So here we have a champion in life's dropout. Wrecked by the devil and society can't help him. It looks like a hopeless situation, doesn't it? But one night when it looked hopeless, and was as far as all man's help was concerned, a little boat came across that lake. And seated in that boat that night was one who had a light in his eye that was never seen on land or sea. And the only person in all this universe who had a solution to that poor man's problem was the one seated in that boat that night, and that was Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad one time when this old world was going down with all hands aboard and not a lifeboat pushed out from a surrounding world? Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ laid aside, as one man expressed it, laid aside his crown and became the Milky Way and threw off his robes and became the evening cloud and stepped from world to luminous world and dropped as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. And when this world was going down with no help and nobody to help, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. Aren't you glad he came when there was nobody else that could help us? And when he stepped off on that shore, that demoniac saw him. He was accustomed to run and hide and cut himself, but instead of that we see him drawn as a magnet toward Christ until finally he runs and throws himself at the feet of Christ in a huddle. He saw something in the face of Jesus Christ he'd never seen in the face of another man. He saw love and sympathy and understanding and forgiveness and what he saw in the face of Jesus Christ broke his old sinful heart. And if this poor lost world could just get one glimpse of the compassion that face of Christ surely would break the world's heart if they could see their own solution is in Jesus Christ. And here we have this man at Jesus' feet. Now you've read about the great society. You've read the efforts to help people in this nation. And you know what everybody's proposing is the solution to this problem and that problem. 
Now, I'd like to see some caseworker take over right here where the Lord Jesus has this man and do something for this character. Now, how did Jesus solve this man's problem? And if you find out how he solved this man's problem, you find out how every person's problem has to be solved. If a great society is built, it has to be built the way the Lord Jesus Christ built it. First of all, he said, how much do you make a year? How much do I make a year? Yeah. Do you have an income of $3,500 a year? Oh, no. <laughs> Nothing like that. He says, well, that's basic. That's where we got to start. You've just got to have an income of $3,500 a year. That's an essential. You say, I preach you, you're not opposing folks having an income of $3,500 a year, are you? No, I don't care if folks have an income of $25,000 a year. I don't care how much income they have. I wish everybody did get $25,000 a year. So you're not, a, uh, you, you, you're not proposing that we don't help folks that need help. No, not at all. But I, you might be uh, surprised to find out that I believe in poverty. People say, are you against poverty? No, I'm for it. I really am. The Bible's for it. Don't let, you, don't let anybody tell you different. I don't believe anybody in America who can't help himself, a blind person, an old person, or a sick person, I don't believe anybody should be allowed to suffer or go hungry or lack housing. I think we ought to take care of those folks if we have to pawn the homes we live in to take care of. But at the same time, I don't believe anybody who can do something and won't do it ought to be given anything by the government or by anybody else either. I believe poverty marks the line between folks who will work and won't work, and the Word of God says if they don't work, not to eat. That's what the Word of God said. And when they begin to propose annual incomes instead of salaries, that means they're going to give some tramp something that didn't earn it, and I'm against that, and the Word of God's against that. And if you took $25,000 and stuck it, stuck it in the hand of every individual in this nation at the beginning of every year, you not only would not solve any problem that's basically wrong with people in America, you would create 10,000 problems that do not already exist in this nation. And a lot of money in anybody's pocket is not the solution to what's basically wrong with people in this nation. And if that's what we think is basic, then we just have the thing wrong. Then he said, uh, what kind of house you live in? What kind of house? Yeah, well, I, you mean you live out here? Yeah. Well, we've got to get you in a split level. At least 1650 a year, no less. And this neighborhood, brother, listen, we, we can't leave you in a neighborhood like this. You just can't make it in this kind of a neighborhood. You say, are you opposed to folks having nice houses? No, I'm not opposed to folks having nice houses. I wish everybody in the world had a nice house. But just taking a person out of a bad house and putting him in a nice house is not going to solve what's wrong with it. And if you took a hundred people out of what we call rundown sections of America and took a hundred people out of what we call kept up sections of a city and switched them in 95 cases out of 100 the run down section would look like the kept up section and the kept up section would look like the run down section in the course of a year and just putting folks in bigger houses does not solve what's basically wrong with people and if we think this is something that can be solved materially, then we have the wrong idea about it. And the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned none of those things, and that wasn't his approach when he went to solve this man's problem. What did the Lord Jesus do for this man? First of all, he got the devil out of his heart. And that's the starting place. And he got inside of himself. And believe me, over the course of my ministry, I've seen people in every conceivable shape. 
I've seen them so drunk come into a meeting they'd knock the chairs down on one side of the aisle and the chairs down on the other side of the aisle they'd stagger it up the aisle they'd sit there and somehow or other the gospel would get through the old besoaked, whiskey besoaked brain down into their sinful old hearts. I've seen them get saved and walk out as straight as a die. The next night I'd see that same person back in that audience and you wouldn't recognize him as the person who got saved the night before. When you get Christ in the heart, you don't start out here and work in, you start in here and work out. And when you get Christ in the heart, you have solved man's biggest problem. And if he's a drunkard, all of a sudden he's sober. And if he's a tramp, all of a sudden he's respectable. If he's immoral, he's clean. If he curses, his language is clean. And the, the Christ in the heart is the solution to what people need in this nation today. And then he dressed him up. Did you ever get dressed up? I'll never forget tonight I got dressed up. I was a little country boy, seven years old. I wore overalls to church. Kids today don't know what overalls were. Overalls were Levi's with room in them. <laughs> Somebody said to me not long ago, said, uh, don't you think girls are getting taller? I said, yes. They said, why? I said, the britches are tight. They have to grow up. Which other way could they grow? <laughs> you take a tube of toothpaste and squeeze it in the middle. Guess which way the toothpaste is going, you know? <laughs> we wore overalls. Mother made them. I'll tell you, getting ready for bed in those days wasn't... Anything elaborate at all. We usually had just one gallus. Mother washing these things in the old pot and punching them with a stick, we'd lose a gallus and we'd just be walking around with one gallus holding up our overall. Going to bed, you know, we'd wash our feet in the tub at the back door and then we'd go in, stand by the bed, a little kerosene lamp, we'd turn the cover back, and, and all we had on was uh, just overalls and a blue shirt. And I mean, that's all. Don't go get nosy. I mean, that's everything we had on. I mean, that's all we had on. That was the works. These overalls, usually that one gallus was used to fasten with a horseshoe nail here and a heap of stick back here. And we'd get up close to the bed and get our thumb under that gallus and blow the lamp out, drop that gallus and jump. And that's the way we went to bed. I got to where I could blow the lamp out and be in bed and covered up before the room got dark. <laughs> I went to church that night in a little blue walls and blue shirt and the preacher preached on hell and I got convicted and realized I was a sinner and I beat it down the aisle and that audience that night saw a little country boy go down this blue overalls and while they saw him get up and go back to his seat in his blue overalls and blue shirt but that's not what God saw. He saw me go down there with my blue overalls and blue shirt, but he hadn't seen him since. Because that night, while I was kneeling there, he clothed me with his own righteousness and made it so one day, without any credit to me, I can stand to prove before God dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And if you tonight will accept the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, he will clothe you so you'll be acceptable one day before him. And you can go out of here dressed in your sanctified clothes forever if you'll trust the Savior tonight. Then he sent him home. Where he had done the most harm. Where he could do the most good. He said, go home. And tell them how great things God had done for him. And somebody years ago pictured this man going home. His kids were playing out in the lane. They looked up the road and saw their daddy coming. And they ducked down the lane and ran in the house and said, Mother, daddy's coming. Close the window. Close the door. Daddy's coming. Hurry, mother. Daddy's coming. And she hustled, hustled over and bolted the door and fastened the windows. And he came running up and knocked on the door and said, Wife, open the door and let me in. She said, Please go away. All you ever bring us is heartache. 
You create confusion. The children are afraid of you. And all you do is to abuse us. And we get along so much better when you're not here. Why don't you just leave and, and never come back? Why don't you just disappear? It would be so much better for everybody if you just go. Oh, but he said, wait a minute, wife. It's not going to be like that anymore. Something happened. Something wonderful happened. Open that door. Let me tell you something. A wonderful thing has happened. And something in the appeal of his voice made her open the door. And can you see him sitting with his children on his knee and his arm around his wife's waist telling the story, save for grace. And how joy bells came ringing in that home when that man went home under the control of Jesus Christ. Roy Gustafson, many years ago, was pastor after he'd finished college, a little Baptist church in Venice, Florida. He called me one day and said, I want you to come home and meet. And I went down to Roy's church in Venice. We were driving around the car one day, and he pointed out a house to him. And he said, see that house? You couldn't tell what color it would be. It had a box for steps up to the porch. Had more cardboard in the windows than glass. He said the town drunk lives in that house. He said he's the most brilliant man in citrus in this whole country, but said he's a town drunk. He said they don't even have furniture in that house, so they sit on boxes. He said they don't have dishes on the table, they eat off bucket lids. Drink out of tomato cans. He said, that man's wife looks like ragamuffins. Uh, and children look like ragamuffins. He said, I'm going to ask him to church. He went up to the door, knocked on the door, and Ray came to the door. And Roy said, Ray, I'd like to have you come here this man and preach. And Ray said, I don't have anything fit to wear to church. Roy said, if you'll come, I'll bring you one of my suits. He said, my wife doesn't have anything fit to wear. He said, if she'll come, I'll bring her one of my wife's dresses. He said, preacher, do you mean to tell me that you think enough of me? That you'd bring me a suit and bring my wife one of your wife's dresses to get me to come to church? He said, that's what I'm thinking. He said, you bring them, I'll come. Roy took a suit and a dress. That night, Ray sat right down in front of me, and I preached. Closed the service. He got up and walked out with his family. Next night, he was sitting right there again. And I preached. And when I gave the invitation, Ray hit the deck. He fell down and buried his face in the pew and left a puddle of tears, literally left a puddle of tears. On that pew. He got up off his knees and you could see a man transformed before your eyes. He was saved from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. And his little 13-year-old, about the size of an 8-year-old, with a little old dress that almost dragged her tracks out, was walking behind her mother and daddy on the way back home and she realized something wonderful had happened. And she wanted to get in on it, and she was so excited. And she touched her daddy on the elbow and said, Daddy. And he stopped in the street and said, What, honey? Perhaps the first nice thing he'd ever said to her. She said, Daddy, did what you do down there tonight mean that you're never going to get drunk again? He said, Well, yes, it does. He said, Honey, you will never, ever see your daddy drunk again. In six weeks, there were steps up to the porch. There was glass in the windows. Paint on the house. Furniture in the house. Dishes on the table. Food in the dishes. And clothes on the table. And that man gave more money to God than any man that ever lived in that county up until six years ago when he went home to be with the Lord. The answer is Christ. 
in the heart. And believe me, my friend, tonight if you're here, you might say, well, preacher, you've been talking about drunks and you've been talking about bums. Listen, you if you could see yourself one twenty-five years from this night without Christ in your heart, you'd throw up your hands in horror and run the cracks. I'm showing you that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And the only solution for you or anybody is to get Christ in your heart, get the devil out of your heart, and get yourself under the control of Jesus. And he'll restore unto you the years the locusts have eaten. And he'll bring joy and peace and gladness instead of sorrow and all that accompanies sin. If you'll let him in. We're going to sing in a moment. Christ is going to speak to some of your hearts. He's going to knock at your door and ask you to let him in. Be careful what you say to him. He'll come in if you want him to. And you can go out under his control, save forever. If you'll ask him in. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Just before we pray, how many of you say, Preacher? I've already turned it all over to Christ. I know I'm a Christian tonight. Let me see your hand. Way up high. Thank you. Put them down. That's wonderful. I am always thrilled when I see the hands. And I wish I could listen to every every story of every person that knows the Savior. I know each one of you have your own individual thrilling story about when Christ took charge of you. But before we pray, how many of you couldn't say that and say, Preacher, I, I couldn't say it. I, I was honest. to kept my hand down. But I'd like to have you pray for me. Let me see your hand. Slip it up till I see it. And then take it down and say, yeah, I see your hand, lady. God bless you. How many others? Slip them up till I see them and take them down. Over to my left, I see you. God bless you too, lady. How many others? Give me this privilege to pray for you, will you? Quickly, hold it up till I see it. Yes, I see your hand over there. Now, Father, we thank you for these hands, for this concern. Some who didn't lift their hands, we know tonight, are here who ought to accept the Savior. And we pray that they'll feel the urgency from the wooing of the Spirit of God to come to Christ, to open that heart's door and invite him in. May they not linger now. May they not tarry. May they not argue with thee. May they come and surrender to the Savior tonight for Jesus' sake. Amen. Number 205, have you any room? For Jesus. Have you? He wants all of your heart. Come for salvation tonight. Come for re-education of life. The pastor's here to greet you at the front. And while we stand, while we sing together, come on, let us stand, let us sing. Come on.